Hello and thanks for joining me for some more landscape photography but as you probably already know from the title there isn't going to be any new photography in this particular video. That said there will be quite a few images to illustrate some of my points uh, but if you've happened to have clicked on it by accident do feel free to hammer my YouTube watch time figures and click away now. Before you do though why not subscribe because I do have another mountain video in the pipeline. Uh, let's start by talking about gear because quite a few eagle-eyed viewers have written in over the last few videos that I've made uh, having noticed that I'm using equipment different to that which I came into 2021 with uh, and for some reason people are interested. I'm not remotely a gearhead. Um, on the photography podcast, whenever gear comes up, I glaze over and I, you know, I've usually got a book on the go so I can sit and read that while the boys bang on about Nikon versus Canon and Sony and whatever else. Um, my gear has been chosen specifically because it fits what I do, which is quite a lot of hiking and in particular hiking up steep hills. And so it was always to do with the weight of the equipment. That said, there's still a balance to be struck between the weight of the equipment and the quality of the images that I could create with it. So I've been using Olympus now for I think about three and a bit years uh, and I found it to be an extremely good system. When I bought into Olympus and that was the only bit of gear that I've got that I bought brand new which is this EM1 Mark II uh, and when I bought it, it was already quite long in the tooth and it was only just before the Mark III came out. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, it's a 2016 design, I think. So we're now five, getting on for six years old. Um, and quite a few people asked me, well, aren't you a bit upset that you have bought into this and you didn't buy the Mark III or the, the EM1X? And the short answer is no, not at all, because those are geared up for things that I just don't do. They're more uh, suitable for things like fast sports photography and wildlife because of the uh, additional frame rates and that sort of thing in the new processors. What this does for me is gives me a really good platform for the sort of slow, thoughtful landscape photography that is pretty much all I do. So very happy with that. Absolutely no uh, intention of changing it. And I just don't give any thought to gear at all. When somebody mentions, oh, there's a new camera out, means nothing to me <laughs> whatsoever. Um, and in fact, one of the questions that I've been asked is, uh, and uh, let me just very quickly give a credit to whoever asked it because, yeah, John Pusey, he said, if Olympus didn't make cameras, what equipment would you use? And the very short answer to that is, well, Panasonic. Uh, because of the Micro Four Thirds system, I'd be able to use all my lenses. Um, and it's the weight of the lenses that causes problems for me if I was using a different system. So not so much the camera bodies, because actually this EM1 Mark II is quite a chunky body uh, but if I want to use good quality lenses then I'm going to be carrying around a much heavier bag if I use something for example like my friends like quite a few of my friends use Sony uh, with the full frame cameras uh, I was out with them quite recently in the Lake District and uh, you know I was looking at their bags with zero envy as they were hauling them up to a mountain summit so Happy with the Olympus system, Micro Four Thirds. Uh, and, you know, if you follow my channel for any length of time or you follow me on social media, you will get an idea of the quality of the images that can be produced. Now, it may well be that my images uh, are not that good in some people's opinions, but it's good enough for me. And it's my system and it's my artwork and that's all that matters as far as I'm concerned. So what I did do at the outset was I decided I would try and live with one lens and I lived with it perfectly well for about two and a half years and that was the rather fabulous uh, Olympus f4 12 to 100 millimeter lens uh, a really good lens covers a great focal range and was pretty much all I needed for that period of time however 
What happened about six months ago is that I started using a different lens because I wanted to be even lighter when I was hiking long distances and particularly when I was climbing hills. So I switched over to this much lighter lens which I've shown you before which is the 14 to 150. So the advantages to me were the longer extra 50 millimeters in the focal range, very useful in the mountains. Uh, also, I could live without having it go as wide as 12 millimeters because when I'm in the mountains, I'm usually using the longer end of the telephoto range rather than wide angle. And then I accompanied it with this body. So I bought this EM5 Mark III I don't know, maybe 12 months ago, I can't remember. Initially, I bought it so that I'd have a nice little walking about camera and for video work. And it, it's very good for both of those. What I particularly like about it is that its innards are identical to the EM1 Mark II, the essential innards. So the sensor and the processor are exactly the same. So I'm not missing out at all by having a smaller, lighter body. Uh, one or two features are not available on this, but I don't use them anyway, so that was completely irrelevant. Let's just take a look at a few images that I've captured with this lens, hopefully to illustrate why I'm perfectly happy with the quality. This is from a video that I made in the mountains uh, a while ago, uh, and it really does serve as a good example of, of how good this lens is. This is a sunrise from a dog walk that I did back in probably uh, April, I think it was. Uh, just walking around with this lens on my EM5 body. Uh, I don't like to go out without a camera. Uh, and when you see stuff like this and you can make a decent image out of it, I think that demonstrates its value. Lastly, this is from a, a tuition session with a client and all I was doing was taking a, a shot just to demonstrate a composition to the client to illustrate how they might want to set up their shot because when I'm out and about with people I generally don't take photographs because it's about what they're doing, not, not me getting some pictures. Uh, but completely coincidentally when I got home and looked at it I thought it was probably worth developing. But again, a very good example of the quality of that lens. Uh, it's not pro glass, uh, it's not a fixed aperture, it's f4 to f5.6 uh, and that was one of the downsides of me using the 12 to 100. So what I decided to do was to trade that lens in because I wanted a wider aperture. And so what I did was I traded that in and second hand I bought, which is what I've been using recently and what people have been asking about. This is the uh, Olympus MZCO 12 to 40 f2.8. And whilst so far I haven't made a huge amount of use of the f2.8, there certainly will be use cases where it will come in handy. But by and large, because what I found with my 12 to 100 was an awful lot of my photography, particularly when I'm just walking about, was at the wider end of the range. Um, this sort of lives on my camera when I'm hiking. Uh, and so if I haven't got my lightweight, because it's not a big long hike or a steep hike, and I've got this with me, this lens works really well. Very, very happy with it indeed. But what I've also done in order to have some telephoto capability is I've paired it up with the rather fabulous 40 to 150. Again, f2.8 fixed aperture right through the focal range. And I've already made good use of this lens. I also, at the same time, bought the nice little 1.4 teleconverter that matches up with it. And let's just have a, a look at some of the recent images that I've been taken with this set of lenses. Now, when I first got the lens, the first thing I did was pop down to the lakefront where I live uh, and get a shot of where I moor my fishing boat. Uh, and it was a really good test for the lens to find out just how good it captures detail. And then I used it for the first time in the mountains when I went to Denorwig Slate Quarry recently. Uh, and again, I'm using this image as an example where there's lots of detail in the shot to show just how crisp those details are with this lens. As for the 40 to 150, 
this shot um, where I'm lying face down in a field full of thistles, which was uh, an interesting exercise. This lens allowed me at f2.8 to get this sort of shot, and that's what I was looking to achieve, and I was struggling to achieve that with the f4 100 uh, millimeter longest focal length on my previous lens. I've got one more piece of glass that I use. Um, this is purchased as a video lens for vlogging. Uh, it's the 9 to 18. Um, again, not pro glass, not fixed aperture, but very useful. And I've used it quite recently for stills work as it happens. Um, but that usually would have been on my EM5 uh, for vlogging. Now, I actually ended up not using that for vlogging very much because I just found it was just too heavy to lug around two cameras. I do use it for professional work and I paired it, paired it up with this gimbal which uh, quite good value actually off of Amazon, Feotech AZ2000 I think, it sounds like one of Harry Potter's broomsticks but it's really good when paired up with a little EM5 so I use that for commercial work. Now for video work, I'm pretty much exclusively using the DJI Pocket 2 with the Creator Combo extension handle, which allows you to hook up a wireless microphone. And over the last couple of videos, I've been really pleased with the quality of the video. Uh, you can shoot in a flat profile, which allows me to grade it. I um, generally shoot manual. Uh, but what it's got is a slightly bigger sensor than the old version and a wider field of view. So whilst uh, with the old one, I really had problems with dynamic range and that's what prompted me to try the EM5. I did find myself drifting back to using this because it's just so easy. And I think that in really thinking about what I'm doing with the video channel is that I'm really a stills photographer and I don't really want to be particularly working hard on creating videos uh, because I don't want it to detract from the stills work so I want the videos to be as easy as possible. So there's just one more thing to talk about as far as gear is concerned and that's that I've switched over my filtering system to case magnetic filters, the Wolverine system. Absolutely brilliant, tiny. That's, that's my entire set of filters right there. Uh, a circular polarizer, a 0.9 soft grad, and then a 3, 6, and 10 stop ND. Uh, and as you can see, they, they slip nicely into the teeniest of bags, which is what I, all I'm prepared to carry with me. So that's gear. That's what I'm using these days. Um, oh, no, tell a lie. One more thing that I've forgotten about. My main tripod, Peak Design. Um, I love Peak Design stuff, I can't help myself. And the thing is, um, I'm a bit of a tightwad, so most of my stuff is, well actually I tell a lie, all of my stuff, with the exception of the EM1 body, is second hand, um, including this. Uh, there's no way I'm gonna spring for 500 quid for a carbon fiber version. So I was only ever gonna be interested in the aluminium version, slightly heavier, but who cares. Um, but I managed to find this one for a smidgen over 200 quid and I thought, yeah, all right. I love that it's really rigid. I really like this, this flat profile ball head system. Uh, it folds down, it's really compact. Um, it's a bit chunky, so very often one of these ultra lightweight ones behind me will come out into the hills if I'm using this. Uh, but uh, for stuff that doesn't require too much of a hike, very happy with this and um, yeah that's that's my tripod setup so that's gear that's everything I'm using and as I said it's all secondhand um, I, do, I won't spend too much money on anything if I can avoid it uh, not because I can't but because I don't want to um, so yeah uh, hopefully I've answered all of your questions and hopefully uh, with the images I've proved that the uh, lower end lens, the cheaper lens and the smaller walking about camera system still can produce one or two half decent images. Right, let's do some questions. Um, I'm conscious this is dragging on a bit, so apologies if you're losing the will to live. Click away now if you don't need any questions answering. Um, first one's from Toby Jug. I really hope that's your real name. I suspect it isn't. Uh, but nevertheless, Toby has been following the channel for quite some time, often comments, uh, and has what could be quite an interesting question for beginners. Um, he asks, you said you had on a particular image a polarizer, a six-stop filter, 
and a grad filter. How on earth do you set these up and in what order? Um, right, well, first of all, with most filter systems, you have the housing which screws onto the lens and you slide your glass filters into it. With those systems, very often the polarizing filter is built into the housing. So that's the filter that's going to be nearest to the glass. Usually it's got some kind of a gearing system. So you turn a knob and it turns the filter uh, and you set that up. Then the housing usually has two or three slots into which you can put your glass filters. And it doesn't matter what order you put them in, in terms of how the image is going to turn out. So completely whatever you feel comfortable with. But I actually do have a specific order of the way I do it. Let me explain why. So I'm going to demonstrate with the case filters that I'm currently using. So what I'll tend to do is, let's just stick them on a camera. So the first one will be my polarizer if I'm going to be using a polarizer. So I'm shooting water, I want to take the glare down. Polarizer goes on first, the reason for that is I'm going to want to turn it to get the uh, light polarized correctly. So I've turned it, set it up, happy with that. The next one I would put on would be my 0.9 soft grad if I'm going to use it. So that would go on next, and generally speaking, it you wouldn't be turning it very much because you kind of want it pretty level with the horizon. Usually with a grad filter, what you're doing is you're darkening the sky, and that's, that's why you just use a grad. So I put my grad on next, and then having got those two in place, I'm going to set up my shot. So I'm going to set my aperture, my ISO, and I'm going to focus. So and the reason I do all that is because I don't want to be focusing or trying to organize my exposure once I've put my ND on. Because what's going to change with the ND is only the shutter speed. So I'm all set up, I'm focused, then my ND goes on, and then I would dial in the shutter speed that I want to use. With a mirrorless camera, you can see on your screen or through your viewfinder how the image is going to look. And so let's say I dialed in a 10 second exposure. I can see it, hit the shutter, two second timer, and then the shutter's gonna open for 10 seconds. If it's gonna be longer than a minute on this particular camera, it varies camera to camera, but longer than a minute on this, I'm gonna be using the bulb system. And bulb is where you hold the shutter button or hold your remote, more importantly, you don't wanna be trying to hold the shutter button. So you hold your remote and you start holding it, the shutter opens, and when you let go, the shutter closes. Olympus cameras have a facility called Live Time, which allows you just to press a button and it opens. You can go away, make a cup of tea, come back, press the button again and it closes. While it's going on, on your camera, you can see the exposure getting brighter and brighter and you can also see the histogram moving across to the, from left to right. That's really, really useful. And you don't need to do it for exposures that are more than 60 seconds. I, I'll use it for all long exposures. Um, but coming back to the question, the filters, the ND tends to go on last because I want to set it all up before I put the, the uh, filter on. And the advantage of these magnetic filters is they're just so quick and easy, on and off, no problem at all. They come with magnetic lens covers and all I do is have an adapter ring on each of my lenses uh, and for a 77mm system and then some lens covers. So they just live on the lenses and it just makes life really easy. As a landscape photographer, I use these filters quite a lot. If you're doing other sorts of photography, you may find you need filters less. And so it might not be an appropriate system for you. Next question is uh, one that I simply can't answer. A gentleman wrote in and said, I've got a Leo Froto tripod with a self-leveling base and I'm trying to set it up with a Manfrotto fluid head. Might as well be talking Swahili. Um, one thing that I'm absolutely passionate about is knowing my gear inside out, every nuance, so that when I'm taking pictures, I don't have to think about it at all. Um, so absolutely obsessive about understanding it. However, I've got not a clue about any gear that I don't own. So I'm really sorry, I just can't help you. Uh, next question. Okay, Simon Pemberton wrote in and said, 
how can I get the most out of an older SLR camera uh, because I don't want to drop thousands on a new system yet, he says. Uh, it comes back to my previous answer, is to know it inside out because when you understand it and you can create images that you're happy with, that will inform a decision to buy a new camera because you're going to know what you want and what you don't want. Uh, and you're going to know the bits and the bits and bobs. So, for example, one of the things about the Olympus system is you've got twin dials so I can set it up exactly how I want. So I don't have to think about it. I know the front dial is shutter. The back dial is ISO. Usually I've already plugged in my aperture. Um, so I just don't even have to think about it. Um, and you, you may well find then that the familiarity with your gear helps you to decide, well, you know, is a new camera going to give me something more? Um, but also, is it going to be an easy transition or is it going to put barriers in the way of my photography by making things more complicated? So, um, yeah, the short answer would just be use it an awful lot. Also, then, if you're taking lots of pictures and you're enjoying your photography, you will feel more comfortable about dropping thousands of pounds on new equipment because you'll you'll know you're going to get value out of it. So that would be my answer on that. Uh, Simon also asks about astrophotography and he literally says, got any astro tips? Well, short answer, not many because I don't do much astro. However, I do some and actually I do have some tips. So in order to answer this, uh, Let's have a look at some pictures. My first tip is that very often with astrophotography, uh, you really do want to have something in the image in addition to a starry sky. Uh, and so, for example, this one has got an iconic location in it. However, it doesn't have to be iconic because my house isn't iconic. And yet I think that having the moon coming out immediately above the house is integral to the impact of the image. I set this up so that I would be standing about a quarter of a mile from the house and actually the image I was after had the moon only half up immediately between the two chimneys. Uh, but unfortunately, because the sun was still up on the other side of the sky, I couldn't get the definition in it. So I was forced to compromise and wait about uh, 15 minutes and get the moon fully up. But nevertheless, the thing about this is that, yes, it's astrophotography, but it's kind of a hybrid. Another example is this one where uh, I've shot it from a mountain top where I was camping about three o'clock in the morning in May 2019, looking across to Snowdon. So I've got the Milky Way coming out of it. Uh, but what was interesting to me is that the lights snaking up the flank of Snowdon from a series of walkers in the small hours was, was what I felt was interesting about it. Yes, I've captured the Milky Way, but I rarely set out deliberately to capture it. Uh, one last thing I'd say about astrophotography is the processing is so important. You see so many astro uh, photographs with very poor uh, colour interpretation. So the sky can often look quite brown or quite blue. Um, a Milky Way has all sorts of magentas in it. And the bottom line is it doesn't look like that. What tends to happen is if you spot the Milky Way, if you're out in a dark sky area, as I was with this image on top of a mountain, you really only glance it based on peripheral vision. In other words, if you look directly, you can't see it. It kind of you've got to look away from it to see it in the corner of your eye. And when you do, it's subtle. And so I do try and keep my processing of any astro that I do subtle. I don't use a wide angle lens. This is, I think is a 35 millimeter lens, if I recall correctly. But you don't always need a wide angle lens. Certainly the shot of the tower at Llanthwyn Island that I showed you a moment ago was shot at 35 millimeters. If you've got a great big huge slab of sky and it doesn't have any context of a foreground, it will have less impact than something where you construct an image that includes the sky but isn't just the sky, if you see what I mean. Those are my tips for Astro. Okay, so just a couple more and we're all done. This next one comes from a, a chap, I assume it's a chap, I don't know actually, Green Morning Dragon Productions. Okay, um, 
again, this person's been following me for ages, often comments, um, very generous feedback, but I don't know your real name and I apologise, I can't address you uh, in a more friendly manner. However, uh, the question is, um, I know he says, I know you've shot the Clean Peninsula a few times and he's from the UK, but now he, I'm saying he could be a she, and now resides in Japan. Um, and is asking about, have I got any tips for shooting a peninsula? Because uh, he or she wants to capture the Miura Peninsula, which is a similar size. Now, similar size, Clean Peninsula from Carnarvon to Bardsey Island is about 30 miles as the crow flies. So it's pretty big. So I have some thoughts, but I'm going to illustrate them with a few pictures. So let, let's just take a look. Now, the Clean Peninsula does tend to uh, appear in my images as a bit of a, a guest star. It's, it's rarely the uh, object of my image. So when I'm out walking the dog and I'm on the beach, the Clean Peninsula, as you can see at the top of this image, kind of just sits in the background um, and it creates an interesting profile so I don't have a boring flat horizon um, and I do make use of it, but I'm not explicitly shooting the peninsula. Some shots are a little bit wider, and in this instance, clearly I'm more interested in the foreground and the midground. But again, having that range of mountains up on the horizon, which isn't Snowdonia, that is the Clean Peninsula, does add to the image. And of course, when you're shooting the iconic Tour Maur at uh, Llanthwyn Island, uh, you can't help but get the Clean Peninsula in your image. I suppose in some respects can be, in this instance, slightly distracting from the main feature. I haven't set out specifically to try and capture the entire peninsula because I think the short answer to your question is it can't be done especially if it's 30 miles long. So what you really have to do is to pick out some features and use those. Late afternoon from the summit of Elidia Vaur, I'm in this image looking straight down the Clean Peninsula, but what I'm actually interested in is all of the hills and the light and shade in the mid-ground. It, it's coincidental that I'm looking down the Clean Peninsula because when you get beyond those hills in the mid-ground, it rather levels off and there's, there's pretty much nothing to shoot. A bit later on in the same shoot, this is after sunset, uh, getting in a little bit tighter. And what I've got there in the mid-ground, uh, beyond the smooth hill, uh, forget the lit-up foreground, which is the summit of the mountain I'm on, there's Moilelio in the middle, and then towards the back, the twin uh, peaks back there, are uh, Areval. That really forms a really nice backdrop, but it isn't the subject material for my image. On another shoot... I get a little bit nearer and I move to a mountain summit that's uh, closer to the uh, Clean Peninsula in terms of looking down it. Uh, and this time I'm on the summit of Munith Mauer and there's now nothing between me and Areval. Uh, but again, there isn't anything else on the Clean that I'm particularly interested in capturing. During the same shoot, this one presented itself. Uh, and really is from the standpoint of shooting a peninsula um, the only shot that I've got where I would say this is overtly a shot of a feature on the clean peninsula and so yeah coming back to my short answer I don't think it can be done I would say pick some features um, the question also asks about time of day and conditions um, short answer shoot all times of day in all conditions something will present itself as being uh, optimum and then you can work more on that and hopefully end up with an image or a series of images with which you're happy i'm going to come back to john pusey now who asked about what camera system i would use if i wasn't using the em1 uh, we covered that he also asked what trekking poles would you recommend <laughs> what do i know about trekking poles um, the ones i use are black diamond uh, and the only reason I use these is because I was out with friends and I'd forgotten mine and there's no way I'm going to walk up a hill without them so uh, we had to whiz down to better sequoid and that's what they had in the shop that said I didn't go back to my original ones those are far better um, they've served me really well for about three years so black diamond you can't beat them John's final question uh, is one that I'd kind of like to finish on because it's sort of philosophical. Um, and it's, uh, if you could change one thing about photography, what would it be? 
I wouldn't change anything about photography itself. I think what I would do is I would change the attitude of some people to photography. I think that it's a very personal thing. And I think that if you share your work, as I do, on YouTube and social media and so forth, um, you open yourself to critique. And you have to accept that people will critique it. The problem I have and that what I would change is I would change people's mindsets to just remember that if somebody is at a certain stage of their photography, beginner, intermediate, experienced, whatever, and whatever they point their camera at and however they compose their shots and whatever pixels they capture with whatever exposure settings and however they process and present those pictures, it's a very personal thing. And if they invite critique, by all means, offer critique. Make gentle suggestions as to how things might be improved. And improved is heavily subjective. Um, but I think it's important to remember that everybody's photography is their own personal journey. And I think there are so many strident opinions amongst photographers. And I'm not talking about competition judging, although you know, they, they are slightly guilty. Um, but social media and uh, I hear photographers talking about, oh, that wasn't very good and this wasn't very good. And inherently it may not have been, but in a million years I wouldn't tell somebody that because what I don't want to do is burst somebody's bubble. I don't want a, a young enthusiastic photographer who's just learning the ropes and thinking, oh, this I could really enjoy this, to then say, oh, no, you're rubbish. Um and and make them feel that, oh, well, they shouldn't bother pursuing it. So the only thing I would change about photography is um, just be nicer to everybody. And remember that somebody who shoots a subject material that, that you don't have any interest in doesn't reduce the worth of that photography. Um, it means something to them. And there will be people out there who also enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, just, you know... Don't get hung up on what somebody else is doing. Just concentrate on what you're doing. That's about it, really. Um, I'm going to leave it there for this one. I'm willing to bet this will be the longest video I've ever made. I'm willing to bet there's probably only about three people still watching. And if so, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate it. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, why not subscribe now and join me next time? Cheers.